All right, thank you everybody for joining us today. We can get started. We have a lot of participants on. We're almost up to 300 here. So thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy day. And we really are looking forward to a great session here. So I'll turn it over to our president and CEO, Chris Swanger. Thank you. Hi everyone. And uh, first and foremost, thank you for joining uh, on this important topic, cocktails to go, uh, what we need to know and we're, we're joined here by a great panel. Uh, and, uh, you know, first and foremost, we hope everybody is staying safe and navigating all the challenges with, with COVID. Uh, this will be the first of a couple of webinars uh, that we plan to host on this topic. Uh, obviously, we're all aware of one of the industries that's been hardest hit by COVID-19 or, or important restaurant, tavern, and bar owners. Uh, you know, it's been a real, real struggle for them. Uh, but one effort, and I'm proud to say that Discus has been very much involved with, is to save neighborhood restaurants and bars and taverns. 31 states plus the District of Columbia, DC, have allowed cocktails to go for carryout. And 22 states have allowed for delivery of cocktails as well. Cocktails to go have given consumers a way to get some normalcy in their lives. Uh, it's been certainly an economic lifeline uh, for the hospitality industry. Uh, in Discus, in the industry, immediately understood the historic opportunity uh, uh, that must be met with a commitment to responsible execution. Anytime when you think about the sale and distribution of beverage alcohol, thinking through the responsibility standards and how to navigate that all the way through the supply chain with our restaurant partners and our retail partners and all of the above always has, has to be top of mind. So states have provided a variety of safeguards uh, to ensure drinks that were consumed at home and not in the car. None of us want patrons under the legal drinking age or uh, none of us in the industry, you know, uh, certainly want uh, people drinking beverage alcohol and driving for sure. So many of uh, the Discus member companies have been very, very invested in this as well. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, you know, obviously the member companies at Discus are very invested in social responsibility. I just want to give you an example. Uh, Brown Foreman uh, recently uh, is the cocktails to go phenomenon started to pick up, uh, they launched a pause to go campaign, which is phenomenal, which helps drive awareness, uh, partnering with our restaurant partners and our bar and tavern partners, just to remind that we all have a role to play in responsibility, including uh, our great consumers on, on what to do when picking up uh, a great cocktail kit or, or beverage alcohol. So. Cocktails to go, it's an economic lifeline. There is no doubt, and we'll talk about that some during the, during the panel session. Uh, the COVID-19 impact on the hospitality industry has been significant. Restaurant sales are down by 78%. Restaurant jobs have been reduced by 86%. It's really hard to imagine that, but the pain is, is great. Craft distillers have lost over 700 million in sales furloughed 30%, 31% of their employees. State innovation provided by economic, economic relief has allowed initiatives like cocktails to go. That has helped many of these restaurants on much needed revenue. And it's met consumers, uh, uh, it's met their needs to enjoy a great cocktail with their dinner from their favorite uh, local bartender. So it does build on the dining uh, uh, at home trend, and that's a positive thing. Uh, so it, part of the focus of this webinar is to talk about this uh, recent phenomenon, but also uh, with a great group of panelists, talk about uh, some of the social responsibility issues that we need to consider and how we as a collective industry can work together uh, to make greater progress. So we're joined with a great group of panelists. Uh, Jonathan Atkins is the executive director of the Governor's Highway Safety Association, a national nonprofit that represents state highway agencies. Jonathan has been on point on traffic safety related matters for over 20 years. 
Uh, he has really been on the forefront of this and has been a great guide, certainly for Discus. Without question, uh, Steve Cat Stevens is the Chief of Police for Buffalo Grove Police Department in Illinois. And he's been on the front lines on traffic safety issues for quite a long time. And we're also privileged, Steve is the, uh, the chairman of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, a global organization. I had the privilege of attending the International Association of Chiefs of Police meeting uh, in Chicago about a year ago, and it's just really phenomenal. And certainly, you know, our law enforcement uh, colleagues uh, have, have had to navigate a lot of challenges over the last five or six months. So we will appreciate uh, chiefs, the chief's point of view. Susan uh, Boley is the Executive Vice President of Council of State Restaurant Associations, where she is really responsible for fostering and promoting the interests of the state restaurant associations by directing an interaction, working closely with the National Restaurant Association and its Education Foundation. I mean, Suzanne in her role uh, is, a, is a great asset collaborating, uh, certainly with Discus, uh, but with all the state trade associations as well. Just imagine the challenges that Suzanne has been confronted with, with many of her restaurant partners. Sarah Bratko, uh, Vice President of Advocacy uh, and General Counsel for the Rhode Island Hospitality Association. Sarah develops and implements legislative and grassroots strategies to promote and protect the businesses. And no doubt about it, uh, Sarah's on the front lines helping all of those great restaurants and bar owners in the great state of Rhode Island. And of course, when you talk about responsibility, uh, uh, Adam Chaffetz with TIPS uh, is really always been on the front lines on these important issues. Adam Chaffetz is the president of training for intervention uh, procedures or TIPS. They are really the global leader in education and training for responsible service, sale, and consumption of beverage alcohol. Adam's father, Dr. Morris Chaffetz, who I had the privilege meeting way back in the day, founded TIPS to train bartenders and others to recognize what dangerous intoxication can do for the establishments, for the individuals and people around them. So, so with that, uh, we're gonna open this up with a series of questions. Uh, Chief, uh, Chief Cat Stevens, you know, from a law enforcement perspective, tell us how cocktails to go differs from buying distilled spirits from a store, wine and grocery store, or beer from a convenience store. What are the certain, uh, what are the specific safeguards that we need to think about? So Chief, over to you and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity and thank you to all the other panel members as well. Um, you know, while cocktails to go concept is new. It's really not that much different than other options that are already in place in many states, including Illinois. So for example, in my state, you can buy a bottle of wine at dinner. Uh, you can drink only half the bottle of wine and you want to take the rest home. And that legislation was passed several years ago in Illinois and many other states. And the, uh, the restaurant will recork your bottle put it in a sealed plastic bag, and now you can take this bottle home so it's not, you're not wasting a half a bottle of wine uh, at the restaurant. And so this has already been in place. So this new concept of cocktails to go, it really, it doesn't change any of our current laws relative to open container laws. Uh, consumers still can't drink while driving. Uh, the cocktails, much like the example I gave, still has to be sealed. Uh, all the establishments are still required to do age verifications like they have in the past in any other manner with alcohol. So there are safeguards in place. And uh, some of my favorite restaurants are doing this and have, and they're being very diligent in their practices. I've watched them. Uh, and like you said, it's a great way for people to support some of their favorite restaurants and establishments that have clearly been struggling uh, since March since this pandemic really hit our country. Um, but anybody who knows me knows I've been in law enforcement for four decades and uh, I've been very passionate about traffic safety, always have. And 
some of my counterparts were a little concerned when they first heard the concept of cocktails to go. They thought the sky would be falling, everybody's gonna be drinking cocktails driving down the road. Um, and they were concerned that, you know, if somebody's gonna get one or two mixed drinks and they're gonna pop them open their car and drink them while they're driving home with dinner. Uh, of course, my question to them was, how would that be any different from somebody going to the convenience store and buying a six pack of beer? That, that same opportunity is still there. They could do the same thing, pop open a can of beer. So really nothing's different. What it comes down to from a law enforcement perspective is law enforcement agencies, we wanna work with consumers and educate them on what cocktails to go is and what it isn't and also work with our local restaurants and bars and establishments to develop a partnership to make sure that we're uh, educating our consumers. So interestingly, in Illinois, since we've had cocktails to go, uh, we haven't seen any increase in any open container violations. And I think that uh, from my perspective, uh, making this type of com uh, concept a permanent law would really provide more consistency and application throughout our country. Um, so those are my thoughts, and uh, maybe Jonathan Adkins, you might have some other thoughts as well. Hey, Chief, thank uh, go ahead, I, uh, Jonathan. Start, oh, thanks, Chris, sorry. Um, I got excited. Um, certainly agree with, with, with the Chief's comments. Uh, the Governor's Highway Safety Association um, to this point have not, has not really heard any, any concerns from traffic safety officials across the country. Uh, I think the key is uh, this is a really good opportunity uh, for the industry to work with law enforcement like Chief Cass Stevens and his teams, uh, but also with state highway safety agencies. And I don't want to get ahead of my uh, colleague from Rhode Island, uh, but Rhode Island is a great example of industry working with um, the state highway safety office. The highway safety offices, um, there's one in every state. Um, they have um, a history of working with industry in restaurants and bars um, to educate the public. Uh, things like napkins, uh, safety messages on your own cakes and restrooms, big signage up. Uh, so this is really an opportunity when we talk about um, the closed containers, making sure that maybe those containers have a, have a, have a safety message on it. Remind folks that, um, that law enforcement is, is still out. Um, the good news is we haven't, um, we haven't heard of any difficulties yet, as the chief says, um, but that's not, um, that's not just luck. We have to remember that um, one thing we've learned from COVID is sometimes uh, folks don't do the right thing. Uh, they're not going to do the safe thing just because it's uh, in everyone's benefit. Think about the number of people that don't wear masks. And so uh, this is a good time to sort of take stock of where we are. We're in a good position, haven't had problems, but let's talk about some partnerships and some opportunities um, to make sure that continues to happen. Jonathan, if I may, uh, you know, traffic has been reduced considerably, I think, as a result of you know, many people working virtually. Uh, uh, but th the important thing about cocktails to go, and the chief mentioned that, you know, open container laws still apply in all the states. Uh, just your perspective on just the traffic safety landscape. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence that, you know, those folks that are all that are out on the roads, they're, they seem to be driving a lot faster. Could you just give us a little bit of perspective overall on traffic safety and what are some of the important things that the industry and certainly, you know, our restaurant and bar partners should think about as, re as, as it relates to cocktails to go in particular. Thanks, Chris. The, the challenge with, with traffic uh, data and, tra and particularly from crashes and injuries is that it comes slowly. And so uh, we don't have as much real time data that we would like, but the data that we do have uh, doesn't paint a great picture overall. Um, we think that uh, particularly in March and April and May and the earlier part of the pandemic, the people who were still driving were those that were risky, those that were more likely to be speeding, uh, those that were more likely to maybe not wear their seatbelt. And so nationally, and we know this from numbers, from preliminary numbers from, uh, from NHTSA and from the National Safety Council, the traffic deaths, uh, while they were down during the pandemic, we didn't have that big decline that we would have expected. Um, as we start to look at June, uh, traffic volumes actually went up. The Federal Highway Administration has some data that um, we're not quite back to normal yet, but um, we're, we're, we're getting close. Um, we do need some drunk driving data. That's something that's been lagging. Um, it takes a little while to get that. Um, and so at this point, we don't, we don't have that, but hopefully we'll have that soon. Great. Thank you. 
Suzanne, uh, as mentioned earlier, you've really been on the front lines to help uh, our restaurant and bar partners, uh, you know, with great hopes that many of them can survive uh, through the economic challenges. Could you, could you talk about uh, why Cocktails to Go has, an, has been an important economic lifeline uh, for many of our on-premise partners throughout the country? Right, thanks, Chris. March hit and everybody knows what happened. We pivoted to carry out and, and delivery and the restaurants reacted beautifully. It was a shocker, but um, they started working on, on those carry out and delivery options and got creative when we introduced cocktails to go. That's given a, a really um, strong bump. What we're seeing is restaurants are realizing nearly 20% of their monthly revenue is, in, is increased from, is, in, is included from the cocktails to go. So we're seeing that adapted. Um, we are also seeing off-premises sales are about 100% off up year over year. So there's really, really been some um, creative responses to this unusual situation. I think also- Yeah, Suzanne, uh, go ahead, go ahead. And I was gonna talk about um, the, the training and such, but go ahead, Chris, if that's where you're going. Yeah, you know, there's been some considerations in some states to even make cocktails to go permanent, like in Iowa. I mm -hmm. mean, does that give uh, many of the restaurants some predictability as they kind of navigate uh, the economic challenges that they're all confronted with? Absolutely, it does. And that's something that we're working on with Discus at the state level. There's a lot of excitement about that. We saw the numbers that are out there, the 31 plus DC, and uh, many are working on this. And so we hope that th these initiatives will help support that. Great, great. And Sarah, Sarah's on the front lines in Rhode Island, uh, working with the Rhode Island Hospitality Association. I remember in the early days of, of March uh, when you know the world changed dramatically for all of us and Cocktails to Go first came up. Uh, you know, one of the important considerations was uh, how, to, how to work with the industry to make sure that the product was sealed properly, just so we avoid any temptation of a consumer uh, taking that cocktail to go and consuming it while driving. Sarah, could you elaborate a little bit of what y'all are working on, uh, certainly in Rhode Island, as it relates to sealed containers, because that's an important provision on all of this, of course. Absolutely. And, and when we first got um, alcohol to go, we started in Rhode Island with just beer and wine, and then we're able to expand it to include um, a limited amount of mixed drinks. And how we were going to transport it was really the number one issue that we needed to figure out. The good news was that we had already gone through this exercise, as was previously mentioned when we did the wine to go. So um, at least in Rhode Island, we had kind of a structure and an idea of what that might look like, what would be acceptable. We had kind of gone through the process of figuring it out, and it's very similar. Um, in Rhode Island, our requirement is that it has to have a, some type of cap on the drink, so you certainly can't have a straw in the drink, and it needs to have some, something like a piece of tape or something over it that indicates that it hasn't been opened. Um, and, you know, we really haven't seen much pushback on that. This has been, you know, as we rolled out Cocktails to Go, it's been relatively seamless here. Um, we haven't heard much pushback from the traffic safety side, who we work with very closely on a variety of issues. And I think a large part of that is because consumers and restaurants recognize that this is a privilege that we have right now. It is a way of supporting restaurants. It's a way about bringing the restaurant experience into your home. I learned very quickly that I am terrible at making my own drinks. So it was helpful to, you know, be able to, to get that help. And so it's a lot about um, everybody working together. And that's something during COVID that at the industry has really excelled at is, you know, working with our customers, working with our employees, working with our community partners to make sure that whatever whatever we're doing has buy-in from all sides. No doubt. And thank you for your leadership, Sarah. And of course, I remember two or three months ago uh, when, you know, the issues of cocktails to go came up. Of course, uh, I reached out to my longtime colleague and friend, Adam Schaffitz with TIPS. Uh, Adam, you know, TIPS has been on the, the forefront helping restaurants and bars 
uh, with all the training platforms. Could you talk a little bit about uh, uh, what TIPS has been doing, certainly to help as it relates to delivery of cocktails to go, because that's obviously an important uh, all right. factor in it all. Let me, let me just back up a little bit because I'm on this panel of experts and I guess we're all experts. And my dad, who is the founding director of National Institutes on Alcoholism and Alcohol Abuse, used to describe an expert is somebody who takes a simple question, explains it in a confusing way and makes the audience feel guilty for not understanding. And so I don't feel I'm an expert, but I feel the people we train are really experts. And some of the things that we've gotten feedback is that, and as the chief talked about what the laws are, sometimes they're inconsistent. And, and it's really confusing because this has been thrown together really, really quickly. And so the state has some laws and regulations then the county has different laws and regulations, and then the city has different laws. And so it, they're all confused. And when they, enfor they ask the enforcement agents on the local level, they, don't, they give a different answer. So there's a lot of confusion and it needs to be consistent. And that's what I'm hearing back from servers across the country. You know, of course you have to make sure the person is of age. Um, I'd love to show you a, a photograph on my phone where people were picking up alcohol to go and the person who was serving had a mask on and the person who was picking up not only had a mask on but had sunglasses on and that person was carded and didn't even ask them to take off their sunglasses and masks and I took a picture of it and it was hilarious. You have to make sure the masks are down. You have to take the sunglasses off. This is basic stuff to make sure. But these are the kind of confusing things that come up. I was talking to the general counsel of the California Liquor Board, and he was telling me all the, the crazy questions they had. And one of the questions they had from a retailer is, hey, since we um, are now trying to help establishments out, can we serve legally underage people now? And I was like, you're kidding. He did not really ask that. He said, I was blown away too. So there are lots of little things that are coming out. Packaging, as one question has come out, um, is really sensitive. Um, in terms of making sure it's sealed. So in other words, they have these things called doggy bags um, that the chief referred to that allowed people to take their bottles of wine to go. These things, once they're sealed, they cannot be opened except one time. So once you break the seal, it shows that it has actually been sealed and you violated that seal. So you, you, you know, if a police officer stops somebody, you, you actually have that shown that it has been broken. The other thing that we need to keep in mind is definitely not to serve somebody or sell to somebody, not only underage, but that's intoxicated. So if somebody comes up that's already impaired, it's not okay to give them a drink. The same applies if they're in your establishment. Um, the other thing, and I know we got the highways traffic safety people here and we're worried about people on the road, it's not just driving, it's also walking. So people that live in pro close proximity to the establishment, you also have to keep in mind they could step out in front of a car, they could fall off the curb, they could hurt themselves if they're drinking, walking down the street. We train these people to deal with all these different situations so that they're more apt to make a smart decision. They don't cause a safety risk. And most importantly, they don't put in jeopardy the, the chance that they're not going to be able to serve cocktails to go because we want that to continue, especially through this hard time. And Adam, y'all have got a certification uh, platform for delivery drivers, right? Because this is a new phenomenon. Uh, right. For, we, we actually uh, had been delivery lobbied. Delivery drivers of just all the things that they got to think about, right? We had, we had been lobbied by a lot of the delivery groups um, to develop a specific delivery program. It also encompassed some of our off-premise and our off-premise had to go situations in it. So there are a lot of different things that go into delivery situations. Um, some of the funny ones, I'll just bring up one cute one, is that with delivery, um, and it can be the same thing with to-go, if somebody's picking it up, you ask for an ID, and the person says, I'm not sure this is a valid ID, they turn to their friend and say, show them your ID, I can't serve this or sell this without a valid ID, they show a valid ID and say, okay, well, obviously, at that point, that's a third-party sale, and how do you deal with those situations? So. So in terms of the training, we train people to recognize when something's going on, the little nuances that come up that may cause an illegal sale to occur or a dangerous sale to occur. 
Absolutely. The one theme that I'm, I think I'm hearing from most everybody is consistency. Just given the, the fabric of the United States and how beverage alcohol laws are determined state by state, one thing that will help the restaurants in bars and taverns is some consistency. Chief, I think you mentioned that, and Jonathan as well, uh, Adam for sure. Uh, here's a broader question. Uh, certainly, underage drinking and, and drunk driving, uh, in large part, is it's at its lowest levels. And I think an element, Adam, you referred to, you know, that one person trying to navigate the system, put on the sunglasses and the face mask, right? Uh, you know, I, I ask all the panelists, you know, as, as the beverage alcohol laws have become a little bit more flexible now as a result to uh, certainly accommodating, supporting, providing an economic lifeline for our restaurant and bar partners, what do we need to do, you know, uh, in, in collective order to make sure that we keep underage drinking? and drunk driving going down in the right direction, right? The, the, the worst, you know, fallback for our industry is we see, you know, uh, things popping back, back up in a bad way. So I'll just open it up to the group. Uh, Chief, uh, Jonathan, maybe over to you to kick it off and then please everybody Thanks. chime in. Thanks, Chris. Um, I, and I touched on this a little bit earlier, but I, I, I have to mention it again. It's really incumbent upon law enforcement to develop relationships uh, with the establishments in your community, make sure all your servers are Bassett trained, uh, make sure that the, uh, the businesses are aware of what you can do and can't do with cocktails to go. Uh, many states like Illinois, they were quick to pass a law, but then they were slow to promulgate the rules that would be associated with that law. So uh, for law enforcement, uh, we need to develop those partnerships, make those personal visits to the establishment in your community, and make sure that we're educated, both our officers are educated, what is a violation and what isn't, and, uh, and our partnering establishments in our community are educated as well. That, that really, I think, is our most important tool. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, some things- Go to, ahead, Adam. So some things to keep in mind is, in terms of underage, um, I've, I've actually seen this at state liquor stores too, and I've actually talked to the directors and they now put up signs saying you have to pull down your mask to show because the clerks were saying, hey, I, I, I can tell through the mask, not okay. So it's, it's all, all of us need to be into that. But the other aspect that's interesting, and there was actually an article in the Washington Post, there were some kids dressing up as elderly women and, so, and they were getting away with it. So we really need to be careful when we serve these drinks to people. The other thing that I'm hearing back from people um, on the front lines is that people will um, overpour mixed drinks uh, when it's to go because they feel they're doing a favor for the customer. Not a good idea. It should be a measured drink. People should remember, hey, make sure your drinks are measured. Doesn't cut, cut somebody off. Uh, give anybody advantage. It's not a smart thing to do and it can cause a problem. The other th interesting thing things that came out that I talked to my trainers around the country is it seems that East Coast people um, don't take the rules as seriously and don't really care. They're, and maybe it's because they feel they're in a more desperate situation in their establishments. Um, Midwest and West Coast are much more interested in following the rules. So I, you know, I'm generalizing a little there, but that's what my trainers have come back to me and told me. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And then the last thing on the actual laws, once we make these regulatory changes, it's really hard to roll them back. So we have to make sure we're really careful when we list these things out for regulators so that we all are on the same page and it doesn't cause any problems down the line. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a great question from the audience and maybe direct it to Suzanne and Sarah. Uh, this comes from uh, Master Officer Jim Mastoris. Uh, Discus and responsibility.org has worked closely with Jim. Uh, he, I'm gonna read his question. So uh, Jim is really on the front lines in Arlington, Virginia, working closely uh, with restaurant and bar establishments, just helping those establishments understand their role in helping to promote and support 
a, a strong hospitality business, but things happen in, in the marketplace at times, right? So Jim, under his leadership, helps kind of uh, drive awareness with our restaurant partners. So uh, as a police officer in Arlington, Virginia, I manage the Arlington Restaurant Initiative, which has significantly reduced alcohol-related harm over the past few years through a collaborative program between restaurant and law enforcement. And that's just the way it should work. I'm ad in there, of course. Cocktails to Go has been an important uh, for our hometown restaurants, and we've not seen any citations uh, for server violations. So, so that's a real, real testament uh, for our Arlington uh, County restaurants. He hasn't seen any DUI or open containers uh, during this time through patrons who have resisted, uh, you know, from, you know, just trying to be on point with social distancing. So here's the question, maybe Suzanne and Sarah, can the panelists tell us their number one piece of advice for communities that want to implement, implement cocktails to go safely? So Suzanne and Sarah, you know, how are y'all thinking about this with your great members? Uh, struggling with a with a whole host of issues, right? So over to y'all. So we, um, you know, the good news about Rhode Island is that we're very small, um, and good and bad, depending on the day. Um, and so we have always had a really great relationship with our communities and our law enforcement partners. When we st first started rolling out alcohol to go, the areas where we did see some challenges were in very tourism heavy dependent areas that were very pedestrian based. And there was seemed to be some confusion among the customers um, that we had to kind of educate them that alcohol to, to go does not mean that you can drink in public. So there was a little bit of an education that we had to do on the consumer side of things. Um, so we developed what we called our consumer confidence cards, which were little cards that were handed out to the consumer when they went in to pick up their takeout or they went to go dine in that explained to them, these are the new rules of dining. And it wasn't just on alcohol to go, it was on you know, wearing your face masks and disposing, if you are doing takeout, disposing of your uh, trash responsibly in designated areas. And we saw a really positive um, turnaround very quickly from, from those communities because people, dining out has changed a, a lot. There's a lot of new rules. There's a, not, a lot of new things we have to kind of figure out now. And so we really had an education focused based um, process as we went through it. Yeah, great, Sarah. Education is the key. You know, it's just, you know, part of the challenges the country has had to navigate just on wearing the face masks, right? Understanding why that's so important. You know, you see videos pop up, you know, uh, people struggling to understand the importance of wearing face masks as well. Uh, Suzanne, over to you from a national perspective. Absolutely. So our servers and bartenders um, are trained. We have a, a training program called Serve Safe Alcohol. And so they were trained before COVID hit. We are tracking um, the expanded off-premises um, laws at the state level. So the restaurants understand what's going on. So you have a safe um, alternative restaurant experience really is what I would, I would sell it as. You hear the story, you want to have your favorite tacos, but maybe you want that margarita with it as well. So this is an opportunity to have that in your community. It supports the restaurant, it supports the economy, and I think it's a win-win and people need to understand that it's safe, it's different, and um, go for it. Enjoy. Yeah, you know, another example, I mentioned this earlier, the Pause to Go campaign uh, launched by, by Brown Foreman. That's just an example of just you know, this is going to have to be top of mind, uh, top of mind for everyone uh, uh, within our community, certainly within law enforcement and all of the above. I guess, Jonathan, over to you. Uh, you know, what will you be looking looking at from a from a national traffic safety perspective, and what can the industry, the hospitality industry, collectively uh, do to support uh, GS uh, GHSA uh, as you kind of monitor? you know, the traffic conditions around the country. Yeah, you're hearing some good examples of these partnership ideas. And I can't stress that enough. Um, the, you know, the, the, the chief is really the, the ideal officer and leader in law enforcement in every sense of the word. But unfortunately, not everyone is in that same position um, that he's in. Law enforcement has a lot on their plates right now. And, you know, not everyone thinks of law enforcement in the same way. 
uh, because of some of the other issues that are out there. And so um, it can't be a heavy handed message. This is not the time to, to put something out there saying that if you, if you break this, uh, this rule, you're gonna go to jail, that type of messaging. It needs to be a little bit of a softer message. Um, we want to encourage people to do the right things. There's benefit from a traffic safety standpoint. Certainly, if people take their, their margaritas home, and um, it's lunchtime in the East Coast, and that sounds really good right now, um, but get those home um, and enjoy them and, and uh, stay in that evening and, and, and watch your Netflix or your Hulu. So there's some real opportunities here from a highway safety uh, standpoint, but that partnership between the industry and the highway safety offices has to be critical. So if you're part of industry and you're not working with your state highway safety office, um, please reach out and I'd be glad to help uh, facilitate that. Absolutely. We got one question and I think we've got the answer. Uh, one of the questions was how many control states have adopted uh, cocktails to go? And as I understand it, uh, 11 control states have adopted uh, cocktails to go and including also Montgomery County as well. And, and I can tell you from, uh, from a discus perspective, uh, uh, our control state partners have really been phenomenal in navigating uh, and helping uh, uh, support their consumers, of course, uh, but certainly uh, NABCA and our control state uh, partners have really been on the front lines fulfilling uh, their, uh, their obligations to ensure that the, the sale and distribution of beverage alcohol to consumers is done in a, in a safe way. Uh, another question that we've got, and maybe this might be for Suzanne and Sarah, is any advice on what the sealed packages should look like? I think I saw a comment pop up that uh, one uh, uh, participant on the on the webinar mentioned that when when they ordered cocktails to go, uh, the server put the product in the in the trunk of the car, which is obviously that's a safe way of making sure the product stays, you know, uh, in a control situation en route to someone's home and so forth. But any particular advice on uh, the sealed containers? What the, what should that look like? Uh, I know there's a lot of different examples all throughout the country, right? Correct, they are. And I'll let Sarah dig in a little deeper on this. We've had a lot of discussions among the states and sharing vendors where, that support this. So I think Sarah may have some actual hands-on examples. So um, here, um, everybody does it a little bit differently depending on um, kind of what they're selling. We have one of our members does it almost identically how they do wine to go. They use the exact same bags. Um, they've been able to actually find smaller bags because the uh, jars that they're using are smaller. Um, and so they kind of just, the way that the wine to go works and the way that they're doing it is they have this, this bag that gets sealed and then you staple the receipt to it. Um, so that's been some way that people do it. Like I mentioned before, some people do it with the tape over it. So. Um, and they have writing over it that indicates what's in the drink and when it was sold. Um, but we really, we haven't received much pushback from it. I think um, there really haven't been many instances of, if at all, that I have heard of some, there being an issue with someone driving with it. Most people tend to put it in the back of the trunk. It seems to be kind of the benefit of doing the alcohol to go is with the curbside pickup, which goes in the back of the car. Uh, we also require in Rhode Island, when you do alcohol to go, it gets sold with food. You're not allowed to purchase alcohol to go um, just on its own. And that's very similar to a lot of our liquor laws anyway. We don't have a separate bar license in Rhode Island. So our, our restaurant establishments all have to serve food with, with alcohol. Um, and so that's been very seamless. I, if, as states look into whether or not they want to do this or if they're looking to make this a, a more permanent process, having it rolled into the requirement of serving it with food seems to kind of derail people that might just be looking to grab a drink on their way home or something like that. So I think that kind of partnership works very well together. Absolutely, hey, with limits on how much alcohol can be included in cocktails to go right. Yes, our, our law, um, don't quote me on the numbers, but I believe it is you are allowed to purchase 72 ounces of a cocktail with not more than nine ounces of actual liquor in the cocktail. So um, like I said, don't quote me on those numbers, but it's, it's something close to that ratio. And um, that was really to address two issues. One, um, as Adam said, we don't want people over pouring. We certainly don't want someone just filling up a mason jar with tequila and sending someone home with it. Um, 
and we also want to make sure that the drinks that we're selling is really taking that restaurant experience home. That's the whole purpose of us doing this, is not to make it easier for people to drink. It's not to make it easier for people to, to get alcohol when they're going somewhere. It is to take the dining experience and to take it from the dining room and put it into your living room. And by putting that limit on it, it makes it very seamless and really, I think, highlights that message. Absolutely. Uh, Chief, did you have a question or uh, Jonathan, did I miss that? Yeah. I've got a I great question gonna, from the audience. Go just ahead. Add um, on Sarah's good points that one of our members from out west, um, tying into what Adam said about folks out west, mentioned um, there, there may be opportunities to have small coolers that would be branded with industry's name and a safety message that go in the trunk. I think one of the western states may be doing that. That gets the you know that addresses the the container issue, it keeps it out of the, the eye of the passenger and uh, others in the vehicle and of course the driver. So there may be some opportunities here if the, if, as this um, situation continues to, to look at some interesting packaging, you know, a small cooler or a, um, a, some sort of a, a device to put them in the trunk. Um, Chris? Go ahead, Adam. Go All ahead. right, a um, couple things, just in terms of uh, Jim, the officer in Arlington, he actually was one of our trainers and we've worked with him for years. And, you know, one thing that we train a lot of is, you know, it's one thing to educate the drinker, but it's more important to educate people around the drinker to step into these situations because oftentimes these people don't realize what, how they're behaving. And there was one question on the, uh, on the, the list of questions that came up, whereas if somebody's in an establishment and they've already been drinking and they want a cocktail to go, how can you deal with that? Well, that's a really good point. And it really depends on the condition the person's in, who they're with, whether you can read those kind of things. And that's why the training that um, Suzanne talked about and that we do are also really important for people to do. Also, if you have doubt, don't sell. Um, if people refuse to pull down their mask, don't make the sale. And if um, you feel com uncomfortable or you're not sure, it's not worth the chance, you know, with the, the, the fines that go into serving a minor or somebody that's intoxicated or possibly jeopardizing your liquor license. It's just not worth the chance. So the best you can do is say, hey, we're trying to be safe here. We're trying to follow the rules. We need to make sure that, um, you know, people are of age and we need to check it. You know, there was also a question on DMV expiring. Again, that's going to go back to your best judgment. If the person looks pretty old and it's only been expired for a little while because the DMV is closed or not taking appointments, use your best judgment, you know, and, and most of the people that work in these establishments have really good people skills. Use those people skills. And just on the East Coast, West Coast comment, I know people were, might have been a little bothered by that. That's what I'm hearing from servers and establishments. It's not my words. There just seems, you know, and it's, and again, it's a generalized statement, but it was funny that we got that response from some of the East Coast places that just were like a little more flippant about the rules than the West and Midwest. So I thought that was just kind of interesting to bring up. Absolutely. We've got two great questions from the audience. One is, are the regulations different for someone that's going in to dine in? You know, many restaurants have adopted a 25% or 50% capacity and so forth for those that are dining in versus cocktails to go. So uh, can someone dine in, order a couple of cocktails, certainly for their dinner, and then take a cocktail to go? Is that just something that has been on the forefront of just some of the considerations, Suzanne and, and Sarah, that y'all have had to contend with with your membership? Um, that hasn't really come up. Um, when we had our alcohol to when uh, alcohol to go went into effect, on premise dining was still not permitted, um, and it hasn't really seemed to be an issue. And the reason behind that is because just because someone brings a alcohol orders a cocktail to go does not mean that they are automatically drinking it at that moment in time. Just like sometimes I will you know, order a separate meal to bring home, planning to have it for dinner tomorrow, right? So um, it hasn't really come up as an issue, um, but we'll see as, you know, as on-premise dining continues to expand, we'll, we'll see if that issue comes up. But like I said, it has not been an issue yet. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
One, uh, one other question, and maybe this is for Sarah and Suzanne. Do we have any economic data yet uh, in terms of just how important? We know anecdotally in the restaurants in my neighborhood, uh, cocktails to go has been critical, but do we have any particular data on just how important uh, of a provision cocktails to go has been uh, for our restaurant and bar partners? We do from the National Restaurant uh, Association tracks a lot of data on the topic and that's where I've got my information 20% increase for those who are using cocktails to go. So it's, it is a significant revenue stream opportunity. Got it. And I, I've heard, I mean, you know, a lot of talk about cocktails to go and the requirement to serve food. I would think certainly on behalf of Discus, uh, uh, the, ser the serving of food is an important element of that because uh, if you're aware of the, uh, the virtual bar platform, it helps consumers understand uh, their body weight, how much they eat uh, in terms of their alcohol intake. And I know that's probably posed some challenges for bar and restaurants that aren't naturally uh, positioned to serve food. But I think uh, just making sure that food is part of the element uh, can ensure that uh, uh, consumers are, are, are digesting the food and with their alcohol intake as well. So uh, with that, uh, Paul Humphrey's question uh, is that's, that's related to uh, food intake. Uh, is, that, is that a requirement, I think, by most of the restaurants and bars? Adam? It is in Rhode Island. It is in Rhode Island. I don't know nationally. I mean, is the question: Do you have to be eating food? I know in in, in some establishments now, um, because of the COVID response, there has to be a certain amount of food. Like New York State made it that you have to serve food with alcohol, and so they were just serving a bag of potato chips with food with a cocktail. And so as a result, that kind of upset some people that um, that wasn't considered real food. Um, People are going to find ways around it. Should you be serving food with alcohol? Just in general, forget about COVID, of course. Slows down the absorption rate, gives them something else in their hand. They don't get distracted by, you know, and, and solely focus on the alcohol. But um, is it a requirement in all states? No. Um, with COVID, it has become in some states a requirement. I don't have a list of which ones those are. It's always a good idea, but, you know, um, that gets into a whole bunch of details on training and um, and, and food helps slow down the absorption rate and gives people something else to do. You know, it also is really important to have, you know, the social interaction. And I don't know how this affects um, cocktails to go, but, you know, and I was thinking about this before the webinar, um, and this is something my dad stressed a lot um, in his treatment dealing with alcohol problems, is it's important to drink with people. And it's important to socialize with people. And with this COVID stuff going on, that's that's getting less and less. And it's sure. very dangerous. And if anybody's been into suicide numbers, they're out of control. And the media doesn't talk about it so much. So if people are going to take alcohol to go, I'd put it upon servers to ask them, hey, you know, you're going home, you're spending time with somebody, you know, are you drinking alone? I mean, I don't know. It, you know, when I was a bartender, I was the local shrink and, you know, I talked to all my friends. I knew everything. And so to communicate with people is really important today because we're communicating less and less and we have less social interaction. And I, I, I put it on the local establishments to reach out to their people. It will help once this is over and people start coming back to the establishment to, but to establish a rapport with them and make sure they feel wanted and part of the community. And they shouldn't be drinking alone if they can and, and you know, meet other people and have conversations. Um, as long as it's, it's within the parameters of what's going on, I, I encourage that so much because it's something that, that is hurting a lot of people in our society today. And local establishments, mom and pop shops, restaurants, those are so important to our society to that point alone. Yeah, Adam, we've we've got one question about the, you know the concerns as it relates to pedestrian uh, pedestrian uh, challenges related. Uh, I guess you'd call that traffic safety. Uh, and Sarah, you mentioned particularly in the in the in the towns that are hosting a lot of tourists, 
you can see how you know people are on vacation they're trying to navigate they've got to blow off a lot of steam that's where uh you know challenges can arise uh and we've got we've got to watch out for pedestrian safety and traffic safety and all of the above so uh let's see i think one of the things that i just want to post up uh uh, uh is uh look this is going to be an ongoing dialogue for all of us uh i think we're probably all in agreement that cocktails to go is is an important uh you know economic lifeline for our restaurants and bars but you know this is going to be a team effort uh in partnership with local communities local restaurants and bars law enforcement certainly the traffic safety community uh really to bring all this together uh and i i, I you know the most patriotic thing that we can do at this point is really uh, help support our restaurant and our bartenders and uh, all those in the community that are really, really suffering. And Cocktails to Go has been a great provision uh, that we applaud many, many states of embracing it quickly and taking it on. Uh, uh, on our next webinar, which we'll schedule in about two or three weeks, we'll really focus on the delivery and, and carry out and pick up a beverage alcohol that's an important element uh you know for all of our audiences uh everybody in the audience you know we we've, we've had a broad broad audience i think 500 plus people have signed up to participate and uh you know that's just a, a testament of interest in the issue uh hopefully it's a recognition that cocktails to go is is something important that's helping uh, many of our hospitality partners as well. But this is gonna be a, a, a team effort. And uh, you know, the Distilled Spirits Council of the United States is really gonna be out in front working with our restaurant partners and the hospitality industry uh, to get these provisions locked in, certainly to make, to be made permanent, but also working in close partnership with law enforcement, traffic safety, uh, uh, and, and organ organizations like TIPS just to make sure that uh, everybody is safe, uh, nobody is held liable, and uh, the practice can be really embraced but uh, done in a responsible way. So with that, uh, I just wanna thank everybody for participating. Uh, uh, is there any other questions uh, for the audience? Questions from us? Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, how, how, how can we follow up with you guys? Or please feel free to follow up with any one of us. Um, we're there for you. Um, our website is gettips.com. You should all, you know, OSHA's website's easy to find. Uh, but Sarah, Suzanne, Steve, you know, DISC is also, I'm, let us know what other things there are out there. This is, a, this is an evolving situation and as a result, things are gonna change and, and we wanna stay and hear from, in touch with you and hear from you as to what things are happening and how things are changing and, and whether it's effective or not or, or where can it be improved. Absolutely. Well, Chris, big Chris. Yeah, uh, Chief. Chris, I just wanna say real quickly, uh, first of all, thanks to everybody um, in your shop for putting this webinar together. I think it's extremely important. Thank you for including me representing law enforcement. We're an important partner uh, in this scenario and uh, nobody wants to see local businesses in our community fail. And if we can uh, work together and partner with our local businesses and, uh, and keep our uh, pedestrians and our drivers and passengers safe, I think that's our ultimate key. And it's, uh, it's uh, honored to work with everybody here on this panel. Absolutely. And Suzanne and Sarah, let me just, you know, uh, convey to both of y'all, you know, we appreciate and recognize uh, some of the many challenges that y'all are confronted with. And, you know, uh, please count Discus in uh, to be by your side to help your great members survive and ultimately thrive through all of it. And we appreciate your leadership on this issue and certainly Jonathan as well. Uh, obviously, we're going to be highlighting this big time on social media. Uh, any particular questions that we may have missed, uh, please uh, register them uh, with us. 
uh, here at Discus and we'll come back to you and stay tuned. Uh, we'll be doing our next uh, webinar on this very important subject in about two or three weeks uh, with, a, with a focus on, on delivery and carry out and pick up uh, for many of our uh, both on and off premise partners as well. So a big thank you to all of y'all for being on the panel and uh, stay safe and healthy. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.